And I want to welcome Sujana to talk to us about the clinical aspects of hearing loss and some of the disorders that um, cause us to have difficulty. Thank you, Dr. Gates. Thank you to um, the prior Deafness Research Foundation for inviting me. I think I'm just sort of like the, lim the lemon ice you get in between courses of really good stuff. So I'm here to cleanse your palate a little, bring it back to something that is a little bit more readily understandable. Um, so we've heard about how we hear. And you saw this very complex system, and you saw this beautiful videotape showing us how we hear. So when there are all these parts, something can go wrong with every single part. So something can impede the sound from getting, hmm. let's see. see I made the, the fatal mistake of not knowing how to use this. Ah. Uh, it can impair the sound from getting from the world to the eardrum. And in fact, in the developing world, a huge percentage of hearing loss uh, is actually from cerumen, from earwax that is not treated, that causes hearing and language and learning problems. Um, it can, the eardrum cannot move well, and it can either be a hard and thick, or it can actually have a hole in it. You can have fluid in the middle ear. If any of you have had children or grandchildren, 85% of them have had at least one ear infection by the time they're three, and that impairs their hearing. And ear tube surgery is the number one operation performed on children, and it is performed for the hearing loss due to fluid that is located in the middle ear. And then, of course, we have the inner ear and nerve type of uh, hearing problems that we're going to be discussing much more in detail. So physicians can tell you the type of hearing loss you have and the degree of hearing loss you have. And I think the gentleman's question about what percentage do you have to lose before you actually can't hear is very interesting. We set, we uh, cardiologists have an EKG, we have a hearing test, we have an audiogram. So the audiogram is set up from very soft to very loud sounds, low, medium, and high frequency sounds like a piano keyboard. And we can measure your hearing at different aspects, and we can tell you whether you have normal hearing, which is you hear sounds softer than 25 decibels consistently across frequencies, whether you have a mild loss. So it takes sounds that are between 25 and 40 decibels for you to perceive them and then whether you have a moderate, severe, or profound hearing loss, which means it takes louder and louder sounds for you to even perceive them. And so we can tell you the degree of hearing loss that you have. There is something called a speech banana, so that um, most of the sounds of normal conversation exist in these frequency bands at these loudness levels. And the, Dr. Gates showed you that the hearing loss as we age kind of looks like this. So what you're missing as you get older and normal hearing loss of aging is the high frequency consonants. So you're missing the meanings of words. So the words wise, wide, wipe, and wife all kind of sound like why, but if you're able to look at the speaker, and take it in context, you can figure out which of those words is being said. So there can be conductive hearing loss, which uh, impairs the sound from getting to the inner ear, or there can be sensory neural hearing loss, which is a loss of the inner ear, nerve, or brain. And we can tell this by simple tests, like a tuning fork in the office. We can tell this by doing a hearing test on you in a booth or in a school. Um, we can test children as young as immediately newborn, and we do that, and that's uh, mandated um, for universal newborn hearing screening in the United States. So we can identify these children very early because we know, based on the way the brain can really adapt, that if we can identify these children very early 
and institute some sort of hearing remediation early, then we can help them acquire language and the building blocks for learning, which is really the most important thing. So the hearing test can tell you that you have a conductive hearing loss. So when we test your nerve, which means we put a little oscillator on the bone behind your ear, and we bypass everything else, and we just stimulate your inner ear, you get all the answers right. You're, you did great. You heard everything at 10 decibels. But when we put the headphone on your ear, you didn't do so hot. You got about a 45 or 50 decibel threshold. And that gap between where the nerve can hear and where the ear actually hears is called an air bone gap. And that's usually, that is always associated with a mechanical hearing loss. And since surgeons are mechanics who get to wear very cool scrub uniforms, we love that because we can take care of that for the most part. So what can cause a conductive hearing loss? Well, you could have left a bit of your Q-tip in your ear and that could prevent sounds from getting there. Um, here, ear wax, as I said, in the developing world is a significant problem, but for people who use hearing aids, it can really close off the ear. And so just a simple thing like that is something that can be taken care of very, sim very easily. This is um, an ear drum, and there are bumps in the ear canal from a cold water swimmer or a surfer, and they can be sort of interesting to look at but not bothersome like this, or they can just completely close off the ear like that. And these are all things that we can deal with as, um, as surgeons. The eardrum can have holes in it, like this one, where the whole eardrum is pretty much missing. There's a little bit left over here. You're not really supposed to be able to see any of the structures of the middle ear like you do here. Um, or it can be just replaced by scar. And generally, even though it kind of looks ugly like this, for the most part, it doesn't cause too much hearing loss. This, however, causes a very significant hearing loss. So we can fix the eardrum. And again, we're mechanics. It's a mechanical problem. We take a little bit of your own tissue. We raise things up. We freshen things up. We put the fascia or we put the tissue where we want. We close it up. Our success rate for this surgery is very nice. It's over 95%. It can be done under general anesthesia. It can be done under twilight. So this is a very nice operation. And it really helps with hearing, prevents with drainage. It's very nice. Um, what can we do? So you know, earlier we talked about there, there are so many different causes of nerve type hearing loss. There can be genetic, there can be aging, there can be toxicity. Well, there's so many different types of hearing loss anyway. So if your problem is that your eardrum gets perforated, is there a way for us to develop things so that you don't have to undergo surgery, so that we can fix this with some you know, magic potion in the office? And that's something that people are looking at as well. As I said, Middle ear fluid causes, is a problem uh, with acute otitis media occurring in, the, in 84% of children by the age of three. And recurrent infections are a big problem in childhood. They also have a pretty big bump in uh, over 65, and they're reasonable in, middle, in the middle uh, area. So those are treated with antibiotics. They can be treated with sort of pushing air up to your ear. Um, you can certainly get an operation where we make a hole in the eardrum, take out this fluid, and put in um, an ear tube. Um, my research is actually looking into other non-surgical ways to try to clear the effusion from the middle ear. But this is another issue. If you have an underlying nerve type of hearing loss and then you have fluid in the middle ear, that just compounds the problem, particularly in young childhood. Children in kindergarten have to acquire language and learning over a 70 decibel noise floor. So it's as if every conversation you had, you had a vacuum cleaner on next to you, and you had to hear above that vacuum cleaner. That's what those children have to hear above. So if we ding them a little bit with some fluid, they really can fall behind a great deal in their education. So there's significant role for research, and some of it, my disclosure is that the surfactant is something that, that I'm working on. 
Um, cholesteatoma sounds very scary. Um, it is a sac of skin growing where it doesn't belong. It's not a type of cancer. It can look hideously ugly like this. It can look very pretty, like a little pearl behind the eardrum like that. Um, at the moment, the only treatment for this is surgical intervention. And um, one, of, one of my professors used to say, gosh, all you need to have a busy ear surgery practice is 10 kids with cholesteatoma because this disease just keeps recurring and recurring and recurring and you get to keep operating on them. Well, none of us want to do that. So certainly there's a significant role for research in taking it out the first time and then putting something there that'll prevent it from recovering, um, from recurring. Um, so there, there's a lot of research in how do we save these children and adults from repeated surgery and, repeat, and hearing loss from this. Otosclerosis is an interesting disease. Um, humans don't regrow hair cells and only humans get otosclerosis. There's no animal that gets a fixation of the third bone, the stapes bone of hearing. It can affect uh, conductive and sensory neural type hearing. It affects more women than men. There may be some ethnic predilection, but it can affect all ethnicities and most age groups. And there's some significant interest in treating early otosclerosis, especially in patients who have a family history of this with Florical or Actinel or um, Boniva, some of these agents to try to prevent the further damage from the sponginess of the bone. Um, and certainly, stapy surgery, which is really fun surgery to do, um, is very effective. But you know, the goal is: can we treat can we treat people and prevent them from having to come to the operating room? Um, we've identified measles virus RNA in otospongiotic bones. We're looking at fluorides. We're looking at the genetic groups that have this. So there's quite a bit going on in that arena as well. So what about if you're hearing to us when you put the oscillator on the bone and you put the um, headset on the ear, what if your responses are the same? So this person has normal responses in the low frequencies, then goes to mild hearing loss in the mid frequencies and moderately severe hearing loss in the high frequencies. So vowels are no problem, but consonants are really difficult, especially in a situation where there's more than two speakers. So in a group, over lunch, at a cocktail party, at a meeting like this, where maybe you're not seeing my faces clearly, and these patients come in and they say, I know that people are talking, but I'm not really sure what they're saying. And it's very interesting, because they know, they hear the sound, they know you're talking. But again, if you're not enunciating normally, not over-enunciating like this, but actually just enunciating like a normal person, um, or if you're turning your back as you talk. And a lot of my patients will tell me when I go to my internist, he or she is typing and talking into the computer. And I have no idea what they're telling me because I'm sitting over here. So it's important for us as healthcare providers to kind of turn and to enable you to understand what we're saying. My children mumble all the time. I have two teenagers, a preteen, and a little one who just won't stop talking anyway. But, but um, the teenagers are super mumblers. And they mumble and turn away and talk into their texting. I don't know what they're doing. But when they need to talk to their grandparents, I tell them, stop, look at your grandmother and tell her what you're saying. And she will understand, or my or grandfather will understand. But if you look away and you talk while you're moving to another room, they're gonna have no idea what you're talking about. Plus their subject matter is a little strange. <laughs> um, Sudden hearing loss is an otologic emergency. You wake up in the morning and suddenly you can't hear, usually out of one ear, and usually you have ringing in that ear, and you may have vertigo or a sensation of whirling. Um, and uh, this, is, this occurs, affects five to 20 per uh, 100,000 people. It's actually probably more prevalent than that. It's just not been, the incidence has not been studied for a while. Um, 
the American Academy of Otolaryngology, which is the National Ear, Nose, and Throat Surgeons Group, is coming out with clinical practice guidelines to help the emergency room physician, the internist, and the ENT identify this problem early and treat early because there is a window of opportunity for treatment and this is somewhere where we can often intervene and restore that sense before the hair cells die because we're still waiting to figure out how to bring new hair cells in, but before they die, we need to be able to intervene to prevent that. So um, you can get other problems. Acoustic neuroma can present like this. You can take steroids by mouth. You can inject the ear with steroids. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of things to think about when somebody like this comes into the office. Um, what we want to know is how do we identify people who will actually benefit from steroid treatment and what do we do about those people who don't? And there's some really interesting uh, National Institutes of Health funded research going on just um, over the, over the Triborough Bridge at Long Island Jewish Hospital by Andrea Van Butis, um, looking at patients who are with sudden hearing loss who don't respond to steroids and figuring out if we can give them um, something else that can, again, prevent that hair cell death. Because once we get, once they, the hair cells die, we send it, we send that patient over to those smart guys to my left at the panel. So let's, let's see if, how many we can prevent from getting there. So what, the question was very interesting. The buses, even though they sound quite loud, they're not all that loud. Um, but the A train at Columbus Circle roars in at 90 decibels. And so if you're a passenger and you're exposed to it a couple of times a day, it's not a big deal. If you work on the platform, if you're the newspaper guy on that platform, or you're the conductor of the train, or you're the police person standing there, you're really exposed to very loud noises repeatedly over the course of the day. Um, it's interesting, there are some studies done, like LaGuardia Airport is right by, um, right by some schools. And uh, the cohorts of children whose playgrounds were in the path of the, LaGuardia has a really short runway, so they actually land very abruptly, um, and they don't have a big area away from civilization where, they, where the planes land. And those children, as a cohort, had more hearing loss than the children whose school playgrounds were not in the flight path. So there's a lot of noise if you, if you ever go to Elmhurst, uh, or Jackson Heights in Queens, we have an elevated subway system there. And if, if you're walking along, you'll, you'll know the people who are not used to being there because when the train goes by, our voices get louder to compensate for that noise. The people who work there are so used to it, they just talk at the same level because they almost don't even hear it. But they're exposed to damaging noises all the time. Um, iPods are a big problem. Uh, Dr. Gates talked about some of this. You know, this is, this is a mother saying, I said MP3 players might cause hearing loss. And this kid is kind of tuned out, kind of pulled his earbuds out. But there's a lot of things that we're exposed to toxicity-wise, noise, uh, as well as other toxins. There's some interesting research. The Army is giving N-acetylcysteine to its soldiers to treat and prevent noise-induced hearing loss and tinnitus or ringing of the ear. Um, and that's bench to bedside in, in uh, my lifetime as an otolaryngologist in the past 20, 25 years. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things about prevention and treatment that are going on. So 36 million people in the United States need hearing aids. 20% of them get them. They no longer look like that. I mean, that lady kind of looks cool, but you probably don't want to look like her at a party. So of the world of people who need hearing aids, most of them don't have hearing aids. Um, a small percentage are happy with their hearing aids, and then a little bit larger percentage are unhappy with their hearing aids. And they're unhappy for a number of reasons, even though the types of hearing aids that are available really run the gamut uh, from tiny to large, from nearly invisible to visible. Um, there are also assistive listening devices that I usually counsel patients about, and these are very helpful in terms of um, uh, waking up and going to work or hearing the smoke alarm, et cetera. 
Um, there are semi-permanent hearing aids or partially implantable hearing aids. These are all the, the sort of uh, research that's happening in, happening in hearing aids, and uh, that's a technology where things do change very rapidly. Um, what we're looking toward are totally implantable and invisible devices that solve the feedback problem, that solve the perception problem, um, and that we're really limited in that by the size of batteries. So as battery technology gets batteries to become as small as a little chip, then hearing aids and cochlear implants will become smaller and smaller and may in fact become completely implantable. Um, this is where hair cell regeneration and gene therapy that you're gonna hear about has a great deal of um, place. Um, this is, I'm just gonna scroll quickly different types of hearing aids that are available. Uh, currently or in FDA trials. There are osseointegrated implants. Uh, if you've got normal hearing on one side and hearing loss on the other, the hearing loss side could get a, a osseointegrated implant or a cochlear implant. And there, there's certainly a wealth of options that you should discuss with your otolaryngologist. Um, this is the question about hair cell loss. This, uh, this is from uh, Myron Shapiro, who used to be chair at New Jersey Medical School. This is a normal cochlea with, with every single hair cell remaining. This is a 17-year-old who died in a freak accident, so didn't have time to lose their hearing. This is a cochlea from a 70-year-old man who worked in construction and um, has lost, the, lost all of his hair cells here and most of his hair cells the rest of the way around. Cochlear implant could help this man because it bypasses the hair cell loss and it stimulates the nerve directly. This is the guy though that we would like in the next 10 years or 15 years or 70 years or however long it takes to replace those hair cells, to give him something to regrow those hair cells so that you're hearing as naturally as possible and recreating this missing area. You don't need to know about this. Um, the cochlear implant is very complicated. This is the one yucky slide you're gonna see. It's sort of a big deal operation, but it's uh, certainly something very nice that's there. The outcomes are beautiful, so if you look at any data from cochlear implants from any of the companies, they go from really horrible hearing to mild hearing loss level in the majority. They go from not being able to hear anything, which is the green bars, to being able to hear quite nicely, even in noise. So the other thing that we're doing as surgeons is we're trying to implant as atraumatically as possible so that if you've got some low frequency hearing, you can keep that and then you can hear with the implant at the high frequencies with a view to perfecting that technique so that when my friends give me something to put into the inner ear, I'll be able to gently put it in without hurting everything else. So that's really the, the building blocks that we're placing. And then the auditory brainstem implant is the next thing that is available, and this is to, uh, when there's no cochlear nerve, to be able to help those people here. And that's still, it's, it's an amazing technology, but it's still in its infancy. Tinnitus um, is the abnormal perception of sound, and that can be helped with hearing aids, with maskers, with medical treatment. It's a brain phenomenon, and there is a lot of scope of research in terms of tinnitus. Um, I want to say that in my relatively short career as an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, um, the Deafness Research Foundation, which has been around for 53 years, 25 years ago, I thought that was an appropriate name for it. Now that we're fixing deafness and we're restoring hearing, I think the name Hearing Health Foundation makes the most sense. Thank you. <laughs>